Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo saranto sucedoye olahuri sammyao sanputoshi. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. 师父上人, 各位师兄, 大家, 阿弥陀佛, Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, good afternoon, good evening. Nice to be with you again. Uh, my name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, September 6th here in the Gold Coast. It is Saturday, September 5th in the evening in North America and Europe. And today we're going to be continuing our investigation of the Flower Garland Sutra. We're looking into the Ten Stages chapter, known as the Dashabhumi, the Ten Grounds, the Ten Stages. And uh, it's, we're getting to uh, one of the main turning points of the chapter. Excuse me while I adjust all my, the, the, the frog in my throat and the itch in my eye. <laughs> uh, not very adorned, huh? We're looking at one of the main turning points, uh, which is coming up in, if not next week, then the following week. So uh, I'll refer to that as we go. But uh, what happens today is we're finishing up the section on the Bodhisattva's uh, discovery of, and his display, his sharing of his abilities that are known as shantong in Chinese, psychic powers, abhijna in Sanskrit. They're uh, extraordinary abilities that come to him or her uh, here at the 10th stage, pretty astonishing because science can't measure it. Uh, and yet, it still comes right from the same place, which is the awakened human mind that has been disciplined by and shaped and formed and molded by the Dharma, by the Buddha's teachings. Okay, we ready? Let's get to our text and we'll invoke, I'd like to put a little music into the air. Okay, when we're done, we're gonna come back to page 44, 44 and 45. Now we're gonna scoot up to the top, here it is. Here we are. Got my trusty 90-year-old Dharma friend Clifford Essex here. That's our melody. Are you ready? Namo da fang guang fo wa yun yun wa yin hai hui o pu sa ha da fang guang fo wa
cheerful. They are yang in their musical energy. So back to page 44, scroll, 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 hold on to your stomach here, scrolling, scrolling. Back, oop, here we go. We've been looking at a long section on how the Bodhisattva, as I mentioned, uh, discovers himself what he can do and displays, shows, shows it, uh, his new abilities, his new knowledge, his new talents, his new kung fu, kung fu, this is real Buddhist kung fu. And it's a long series of 10 descriptions of what the Bodhisattva can do. And uh, it's a challenge to, uh, I won't evaluate. We're gonna look at the text first, then we'll evaluate. Okay. Last week we worked, we went halfway through page 44. We're gonna start with Ho Sui Xin Nian Yu Yi Nian Yi Nian Jian Pu Bian Shi Fang Shi Cheng Zheng Jie. Okay, that one, that paragraph right there. Read it first in Chinese, then in English. Here we go. Ho Sui Xin Nian Yu Yi Nian Jian Pu Bian Shi Fang Shi Cheng Zheng Jie, Nai Zhi Nie Pan Qi Yi Guo Du Zhuang Yan Zhi Shi. Huo Xian Qi Shen Pu Bian San Shi. Er Yu Shen Zhong Yo Wu Liang Zhu Fo, Ji Fo Guo Du Zhuang Yan Zhi Shi. Shi Jie Cheng Huai Mi Bu Jie Xian. Huo Yu Zi Shen Yi Mao Kong Zhong, Chu Yi Jie Feng. Or you jung sheng wu so nao hai. Science goes, impossible. Here we go. Or, should he wish to do so in a single instant of thought, he may extend throughout the ten directions, showing the realization of right awakening, up to and including nirvana and the details of the creation of countries. Or, he may make his body appear to extend throughout the three periods of time while within his body there are limitlessly many Buddhas, along with all the features of those Buddhas' lands, with world systems coming into being and passing away that all appear without exception. Or, from within a single hair pore of his body, he may produce winds without bringing harm or trouble to sentient beings. Yeah. We... Uh, we have two threads of the story going along. One is the text, of course, as it unfolds paragraph by paragraph. And then we turn to the third stage, much, much earlier in the same chapter, where it described the, uh, the, the bodhisattva at that level, kind of like third grade versus high school. Uh, a third stage bodhisattva's ability to manage psychic powers, the same shantong. What's the difference? Well, um, one way to describe the difference would be ignorance. There's less of it now. There was more of it then, even though on the third stage a bodhisattva has not much ignorance left, but he chooses, she chooses to hang on to a portion of it so that she can still relate to living beings. Because Buddhas are already at another entire category. Okay? So we're in a series of 10 things that the Bodhisattva can do. Each paragraph goes, or he might, or he might. So these are the options. These are the choices that he has to show. Kind of like what? Um, when was the last time you put some new software on your computer? Um, the I, I, if I'm going to, let's say, uh, Apple upgrades its, its system, its uh, operating system, and I have to upgrade uh, a new iteration of a, a, a program that I'm familiar with, I go to reviews, and the reviews say, oh, it has this new feature, this new feature, this new feature, right? And you go, oh, now that ability was here that wasn't before. How clever those engineers are, those coders uh, in the basement of the Apple building, you know, the Apple campus. How clever. And, and now the Bodhisattva at this point also 
has this list of features. He can do this, he can do this, he can do this. In the ninth stage, he couldn't, okay? On the eighth stage, less. He's not yet a Buddha, but pretty close, okay? So, today's group, what are they? Should he wish to do so? In a single instant of thought, meaning the, there is a thought. It's, it arises by reflection based on the need of living beings. He doesn't have it beforehand. He doesn't hang on to it an instant after its work is done. But for that moment when he's helping out somebody who needs it, this thought. So in emptiness, there's this formation. This bit of code appears on the screen in the, the terminal app, right? It's zeros and ones. In a single instant of thought, he can do what? Extend throughout the ten directions. The bodhisattva can go and including both this way, this way, this way, above and below, all ten. And the result of that expansion, extension of his body, is what? It's a play. It's a show. We talked about Expo in Montreal last time, what I saw as a teenager. And there was a lot of show, much, many shows going on. I mentioned last week watching Ontario's, the province of Ontario had a pavilion at the Montreal World's Fair. And it was at a great song and great movies showing on different parts of the same screen multiple screens, never seen it before, nobody ever had, it was brand new technology and you could see a trout coming out of the, the water and arcing down and you could see a bear pulling a salmon out of the, you could see a great endless forest, the Laurentian shield going on and then you could see a friendly family having a traditional meal and all on the same screen at once, all going on simultaneously and switching and very, uh, for, for a mind that had only seen television on a screen t two decades earlier, this was burning new synapses, right? To see what do you do with your eyeballs as these different stories are being told on a single two-dimensional plane. So our bodhisattva is showing a story. There's a story being told here, and what is it? He's becoming a Buddha. She's becoming a Buddha, okay? The realization of right awakening, zheng jie, is now appearing throughout the ten directions because the bodhisattva in a single instant of thought wants it to. All the way from, up, uh, ignorance is broken, I'm awake, all the way to the end, I'm leaving, my work is done, and all the details of the countries that the bodhisattva can create. How does it go? It goes, qi yi guo du zhuang yan zhi shi. The decoration, the, the putting forth of countries, which are places for living beings to live, where our wishes are fulfilled, our fears are transformed, and we wake up too. That's what this has done. So, what a story. What a good story, right? The Bodhisattva is a storyteller here, using his psychic powers to let others know that you too can do it. I did it, you can do it. Now, don't ask the question, is it real? Dharma Master, is it real? Don't ask that question. For you, the living being, for me, the living being in that country, yeah, sure seems real. It's just a thought in the Bodhisattva's mind, but because his nature is totally uncovered and awake and shining, he can do it. And it seems real, but if you ask me, Dharma Master, is it real? I would say to you, tell me about the last movie series, TV series you binged watched in quarantine. What was it? Was it a Korean soap opera, a K-drama? Right? Crash landing on you? What was it? What was it? Was it real? Well, I sure felt real. I mean, I got involved. I cried and I laughed. And Was it real? Same. 
right? As soon as you unplug your computer, it's no longer real. Boom! The monitor goes black. The display goes black. Oh, as soon as your internet, your router goes down, oh, suddenly you're local. You can't go beyond your own computer. Was it real? Well, when I was online it was, right. So, this is amazing how the Bodhisattva is able to be a storyteller that living beings totally absorb, totally take in, and change, get the res desired result, which is helping us to let go of stuff we can't let go of, helping us face the stuff we don't want to face, right? inspiring us and showing us that we can be better, we can ascend, we can evolve. That's the purpose. And so it's didactic storytelling. It's got a, there's a, there's a goal in mind. Bodhisattva is trying to save us. These are salvation stories, but how wonderful, you know. And now, because we've been watching the Bodhisattva go step by step, stage by stage, we realize that this is, he's a high level professional living being saver, right? He has, he's well trained. This, he's the best at saving us from ourselves, waking us up, bringing out of our nature the best qualities, the kindest, the most generous. The, and look at, there's the other thing that occurred to me as I was reading this was what incredible uh, life-giving force this Bodhisattva has. He is really, I guess the word is fertile in a sense, kind of like the earth is fertile, any seed that you plant, in this case, the seed for the bodhisattva would be somebody needs him. Somebody's hurting. But that seed planted in this bodhisattva's nature produces uh, the PhD candidate's word would be salvific efficacy. He can save us. He can do it. The bodhisattva can get in there and make it better, right? This is an incredible soteriological narrative. Okay, number two that we read. Or he, she, use the pronoun you prefer, may make his, her body appear to extend throughout the three periods of time, while within the body there are limitlessly many Buddhas, along with the features of the Buddha's lands, world systems coming into being and passing away, they all appear without exception. Okay, the one prior, he was one Buddha. He shows himself getting enlightened, going to nirvana, and everything in between. Now, what? Limitlessly many Buddhas. That one story is now multiplied by, what's our number? Wu Liang, Wu Liang Zhu Fu, right? no way to measure them, numbers of Buddhas, and similarly, all the features of those Buddhas' lands with world systems coming into being and passing away appear without exception. So, what are the features of those world systems? We currently, here on planet Earth, are in what's known as the the decaying phase of our planet's lifespan. They, they talk about world systems go through coming into being, abiding, resting, going bad, and then going to void. And then another one starts, phoenix-like, out of the embers of the last one. So... What do people do? People are, if our human body is a small earth, we go through birth, old age, sickness, and death, and rebirth. So five, there's the next cycle going. So we're in the sickness phase of human life, the decaying phase of an earth's life, a planet's life. How do we know? Well, 
This is Labor Day, it's also Father's Day, and California is going through a historic, never before heat wave. Uh, yesterday in Ukiah, it was 109, and it's supposed to be hotter tomorrow. So when, when normal California valleys get into those, the second decanate, right, past 110, it's trouble. In order to, we, I got the heat advisory on my weather app uh, for California, even though I'm here in Australia, and it said, recommended, you know, wear light clothing, drink lots of water, stay indoors, uh, f find ways of cooling the air if you can. Problem being that all those air conditioners eat up the electricity, California can't cope. Rolling blackouts are a new reality for us, which is to say you're offline, no power for that period of time and then you get it back and somebody else loses their power. If everybody all at once, when it's 112 out, goes for the air conditioner, don't have enough electricity. So is this the new normal? Looks like, doesn't it? What do we do? Well, there's a Buddhist perspective that says normal and unlivable, but normal because why? We're in that phase of the eon. It, we don't go back to spring from autumn. Autumn goes to winter. Winter goes to spring, right? So fatalistic, no. Can it be reversed? At a certain point, no, not really. Not when you're melting ice caps. You can't really reverse it. What do you do? You learn to cope. Um, so, our bodhisattva is here saying, right, all these Buddhas in their Buddha lands are showing world systems coming into being and then doing what we don't want them to do, passing away. Um, I would like to not get older, right? I would like to not have so many wrinkles. I would like to be able to eat with an appetite that I used to have. And all. Not part of being 70 years old. It's just the body goes, okay, we're getting older, aren't we? You know, sleeping more, yeah, more naps. Oh my God. And yet consciousness doesn't admit to it until you just can't deny it, right? So, yeah, that's perfectly normal, perfectly scary, because it requires us to change and adapt. We, for example, with the forest fires in California, what people are saying these days is the only way to cope with the 500-some fires burning, the, uh, the fire in our Santa Cruz Redwoods, where we live, is now today 80% contained, 20% still burning. One-fifth is still on fire. Uh, saw the pictures of our governor, Governor Newsom, uh, inspecting Big Basin Big Basin State Park, which is the old growth redwoods. Big Basin is 10 minutes from our, our monastery in, in Santa Cruz. And uh, the trees there are some of the oldest things on planet Earth. And uh, everybody was writing in to the San Francisco Chronicle and online and Twitter about their, their earliest memories of visiting Big Basin. And it's... California's oldest state park and it's very humble you just drive in highway 236 drive in there's the state there's the uh, offices and they'll give you a flyer with some scientific facts and you go walk and you walk and you look up and you look up and there's a little bit of blue sky up here a little circle everything else is red wood and green needles and it's quiet in there and somebody goes, oh, don't step. And you looked under your foot and there's a banana slug. These yellow, slimy creatures that live under redwoods. It's the mascot of the University of California Santa Cruz uh, athletic teams, of which there aren't very many. The banana slugs, yeah, yeah. So it's just astonishing that part 
of the planet, one that 5% still remain. Of the, 90, of the 100% that were once there, 95% of the redwoods that existed have been cut down. 5% are left, and Big Basin is the Bay Area's oldest stand. There's also Muir Woods, there's also Cowell Redwoods, uh, but mostly, if you go further up on Highway 101, uh, out, of, out of the Bay Area, you can find the oldest and the tallest trees. Actually, it's interesting, um, California forestry will not tell you which tree is the tallest redwood. They know, but they don't want people going in and walking around it, because even walking on the base of these giant fossil trees with, with shallow root systems will impact them, will harm them. So anyway, it's not far from City of 10,000 Buddhas, um, where the tallest redwood is. Anyway, the fire has burned away rings worth, inches worth of redwood bark around the trees that, that, that burned. The entire uh, state park infrastructure is ashes, gone. The fire went right through Big Basin. And I saw the photo of our governor touring it with the rangers and they're all going, boy, I remember my dad brought me here and uh, my sister and my sister was engaged here, had her wedding reception, you know, and we loved feeding the deer. So anyway, that's uh, the new normal is not normal because we haven't experienced it before, but it's natural. It's the new normal is completely natural if you understand that we're heading quickly towards the Chengzhu Huai Kong, the decaying phase. What follows it? Kong gone but it's not gone for good it returns whether or not our bodies will be here in the way we are maybe we're going to have to go underground we may have to discover a whole new uh, residence technology that's underground um, wandering through India I remember going through the Buddha's holy places in 1983 with the monks with our Dharma brothers and uh, we were at the Deer Wilds Park, was it? Is that uh, near Bodh Gaya? I guess so. It's um, Jetavana. No, uh, the Jeta Grove is not the one. There's uh, one of the Buddha's holy sites. I f I'm trying to think. It might have been, um, I think it was. It was the, the Deer Wilds Park where the Buddha turned the Wheel of Dharma for the first time, spoke the, the Fire Sermon and the Four Noble Truths, right? They have preserved as an exhibit underground meditation huts. The monks did it. They discovered that in order to survive in that forbidding hot landscape of India, that if they went down, they could do it. And so you can still go and see where, I mean, it's very basic, right? Very primitive. But uh, they were able to make uh, dining rooms, meditation halls, ceremony rooms, residences, you know. Um, perhaps one, if, if California continues to burn, maybe in our experience while we're alive of the, the passing away of world systems that our bodhisattva, our Bodhisattva is making show, making appear. We may have to discover how to make inflammable people because it looks like pretty much everything else is going to burn. Am I pessimistic? Mm, I sure hope not. I would prefer to keep things as they are. But uh, this was real close this time. And it was a little less close last year and the last four years, it's getting closer and closer to have 17,000 lightning strikes in one storm, 500 of which started fires. Yeah, we lost all the water up in Santa Cruz. The water tanks, the pipes in the ground melted. So 
we're going to have to very quickly come up with solutions for how to find ways to get water for people to drink because the water that is there now has got lots of plas melted plastic in it. <laughs> so, yeah, new normal. So Buddhas, as well as showing how this happens, the creation, the abiding, the decaying, and the destruction, they also uh, teach how to change our attitudes so that we can survive. Otherwise, uh, we're already experiencing in the Bay Area days and days and days of smoke-filled air is creating depression among people. People can't take it, having to not only be quarantined because of the pandemic, but be unable to open their windows because the smoky air from the fires is so bad. So we need to come together with humane, kind-hearted, far-sighted, scientifically-based leadership that says, let's talk about how we're gonna get along. How much do we need? What do we have to give up? I would suggest one good thing to give up would be all the weapons, all of the ballistic missiles that are there only to destroy that we're never gonna use if we're in our right minds. Take all that wealth, all that resource, and put it into ways for human beings and the animals and fish and birds and insects on the planet to survive. Why not? That'd be a good way. Life enhancing instead of life destroying. I was a big fan of Congressman Dennis Kucinich from Cleveland, Ohio, who uh, two presidential races back in the days of President George W. Bush Dennis Kucinich ran for president, and he said, I propose a Department of Peace. He said, we're, we're real good at making things that will destroy life, but let's make, make it our business to find ways to enhance our lives. And uh, Congressman Kucinich was also a vegan, is still, he and his wife, Elizabeth. So that's the leadership that can respond to the new challenges we face. So, okay, number three, what else? From within a single pore of his body, he can produce winds without bringing harm or trouble to sentient beings. <laughs> kind of a humorous image, right? Air coming out of his, his hair pores, skin pores. Now, you may think this is bizarre, but uh, I will tell you that someone who has cultivated um, Chinese martial arts, Wu Shu, uh, I won't try to describe it, I'll just tell you what I saw. Uh, our late and beloved master of Chinese, Wu Shu, Dr. Jiang, Jiang Yunzhong, Zhang Shifu, he was uh, uh, taught, at, he created and taught at the Wu School of Chinese Cultural and Martial Arts in El Cerrito. Uh, he was Marty's teacher before Marty met the Buddha Dharma this time. I, I came along later and met Master Zhang. He taught uh, Chuang Gong, standing meditation, right? Where you stand, like that, standing meditation. And he had uh, some of his students, I, I won't name them, they're, they're still teaching at the Berkeley Monastery, carrying on the tradition, but they were good at standing. And on a cold, chilly, Bay Area winter morning, I saw our Dharma brother, who I won't mention his name, standing like this for an hour and seeing steam coming horizontally out of his skin pores. He was able, by standing for an hour, he was able to create and regulate his internal heat, his fire element, that his pores opened up. It was cold, and like you can see, you see your breath on a cold morning. The breath was coming out of his skin because he was 
the, the transformation created by the, the fires of his martial arts skill opened up his pores and kind of like sweating, right? But this was steam was coming out. He's standing there steaming like that. Quite a scene to be standing in a cloud of steam. Yeah, yeah, real stuff. So here's our bodhisattva who is master of the elements of his physical form. Earth, air, fire, water. For him, those are just tools. They're just what you build with. It's like, oh, I got a red crayon, a green crayon, a yellow crayon. I'm gonna make blue and white and black, and beautiful colors, right? Tools. Right? So the bodhisattva can produce winds and steam from hair pore of his body, but he doesn't harm or trouble sentient beings, okay? So that's air element. What else? Ready? I'm on page 46. Going to move on down. Or, should he wish to do so, he can turn boundlessly many world systems into an ocean. In the waters of that ocean, a great lotus blossom appears with splendid light that extends to cover limitlessly many world systems. Within these world systems, the features of the Bodhi tree appear, up to and including showing his realization of omniscient wisdom. Oh boy, he can turn worlds into an ocean. Transformation. That's the water element. And with a single thought, if he chooses to do so with his mind, because it was right and meet and just to do so, he can take world systems and make them an ocean. And in the story, remember our screen in Montreal at the Ontario Pavilion, the World's Fair, multiple th events happening on a single screen and I remember the audiences they bring them in fill the, the theater and we'd go wow and then 10 minutes later we're out and another group fills the seat wow you know I was just in uh, Dunhuang out in Xinjiang in China and uh, Dunhuang is the arts caves right and arts and sculpture and they have done a really really nice job of uh, the Chinese have done a terrific job of giving tourists and art historians and just Buddhists and lovers of culture, giving us a flavor of what Dunhuang represents. It's a, an oasis on the Silk Route. And boy, when you fly out to Dunhuang, you go over mile and mile and mile and mile and mile of nothing. You look down and it's just parched desert, right? And that's what Master Xuanzang traveled over on foot with a horse by himself. Anyway, now we fly over it. And you land in Dunhuang and you go out and they limit the number of people because it's, it's such a, a, a tight, difficult decision they have to make. On one hand, the art historians and the cultural historians and the museum keepers would like to keep everybody out. No, stop coming in because every time you breathe, the art declines or it decays. Your, the carbon dioxide carbon, you know, interacts with the paint and it goes darker. But of course, who, who does it belong to? Well, it belongs to humanity. It's a UNESCO wonder of the world. It belongs to the Chinese, it belongs to the Buddhists. So, so you have to let people in, so they limit, they limit. It's hard, how do you get that balance just right? And you go in, you may not take flash photographs, you may not take your phone and shine it because that'll just turn the wall back to blank clay or sand or lowest soil. Anyway, so they let us in, we go into the auditorium, just like Montreal at the Expo, right? And there's a wonderful IMAX curved screen and they give you a reproduction, uh, a reenactment of what it must have been like to have the camels 
walk their way, and they play the music of camels walking. Right? The camels walk to this oasis and hear trees and there's water and guess what? There are caves. And you go in and oh my goodness, just out of nowhere is this cliff face with caves and inside the caves are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and stories painted on the wall that people can't explain to this day. How was it possible? How did humans make these incredible displays, right? So, yeah, uh, here's out of, out of nothing comes this, these worlds of, of artistic representations of human beings doing these things, right? So to see on the screen this, uh, what it's like to ride a camel from Greece, from Rome, across the, mo the mountains, across the desert, and wind up in Xinjiang. And uh, so it was wonderful to get to see uh, how that was. And, and in, as I mentioned, my youth, we went to Montreal to the World's Fair and saw this first time it was done, multiple screens within a screen. There it was in Dunhuang. They showed screens within a screen, telling the story of its creation, trying to, and it got buried in the sand. Dunhuang was lost for five centuries. Nobody knew it was there, buried, right? The shifting sands. And then uh, a Taoist, thank you, Taoist Wang, Wang, Wang Daoshi, who uh, was taking a long stick and running it through the wall and ran it through this wall and the stick didn't stop, it went all the way in. Dug it out, oh, he found a library cave. And from that cave, he said, Eureka, I've found it. <laughs> and uh, started digging, started digging, started digging, and all the other caves came to, to light. And uh, so, yeah, wonderful. And can you imagine our bodhisattva now is using this ability to turn lands into oceans. What kind of movie is showing up on his multiple screen within a screen? A lotus, a magnificent lotus appears. And there's a light coming off the lotus. It's an interactive lotus. It is an LED lotus. Oh my goodness. And the light shines out covering limitless the world systems, and it's a happy light. We like light. Sunlight is a good, right? Just ask anybody who lives in Oxford, England, where <laughs> you don't see the sun that often, right? Oh my goodness, they say Cambridge is a very hard place to live. In the winter, it's gray and wet and dark. A lot of Ireland is that way, you know. So the light of this lotus flower shines over the world systems. And what does it do? It reveals the Bodhi tree, features of the Bodhi tree, including this, Bodhis, this Buddha's realization of omniscient wisdom. So, whew. like I mentioned last week, um, Sudana arrives at Maitreya's, some, Maitreya's the keeper of Virochana's adorned pavilion. He snaps his fingers, the door is open, Sudana goes in and he sees everywhere, like these kiosks, all appearing at once. He sees images of every lifetime Maitreya lived and how each time he Faputishin made the Bodhi resolve, used the Dharma, woke up, taught living beings, entered Nirvana, distributed his Sharira. All of these appear in front of Sudhana. Right? So here is that story happening. your right brain.
Thank you, thank you. It does help it go down. Indeed, it does. So, wow, E. This, these psychic abilities are incredible. And we're not done. There's more. We, let's see here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six to go. And, yeah. The features of the Bodhi tree appear in these world systems that show up in the light of the lotus flower that arises from the world's ocean. So, Bodhi tree features world systems, light, lotus flower, ocean, lands. A few steps to get there. This is the flower garland world system. This is the Avatamsaka, man. It is hopping. So what are the features of the Bodhi tree? Oh my goodness. Well, this one features our Bodhisattva accomplishing Yiche Zhongzhi. Yiche Zhongzhi is called omniscient wisdom. He's getting, he's becoming a Buddha under the Bodhi tree. So, wow, I didn't know until I started um, poking around in, with Master Xuanzhuang and Master uh, Yi Jing and Master uh, Xian Weixian, the three pilgrims who, of the many pilgrims who, su who succeeded uh, going to India and coming back uh, and telling their stories, right? And uh, what I learned was that being, <laughs> coming into being and going away. Okay, thanks for your patience while we get it all together here. So, um, Bodhi trees. I traveled, and we mentioned India before, on that same trip in 1983 with Dharma Brothers, five of us, and a Peter Schmitz, a layman who traveled with us. Um, we went to the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya and actually spent the night under the Bodhi tree. It was Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. We woke up on Christmas morning under the Bodhi tree, and I thought that was very poetic. Putting, talk about interface dialogue, right? So, founding stories. One Hebrew, Christian, one Buddhist. Uh, wouldn't have been wonderful if I'd become a Buddha under the Bodhi tree that night. Then we could have really put the stories together. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Um, but I remember the Bodhi tree. My impression of it was how broad it was. It's a fig tree. Ficus religiosa is the Latin name for, for the current Bodhi tree. What I learned by studying uh, Fa Xian and Yi Jing and Xuanzang, the three pilgrims, was that Buddhas always wake up under trees, but it's not the same tree. Sometimes it's a sala tree. Other times it's a sandalwood tree. Other times it's a palm tree. <coughs> Other times it's the, fi the fig tree. And the, fig the current Bodhi tree, which is, by the way, stories within stories, the current Bodhi tree is not the original Bodhi tree. It's the grandson of the original Bodhi tree. The original Bodhi tree was cut down by a jealous emperor. Boo, boo, don't do that. And luckily, a scion, S-C-I-O-N, one of the, the, the sprouts of the original Bodhi tree was taken to Sri Lanka. And when they learned that the Bodhi tree had been cut down, they took a scion, a chunk, a sprout of the, the son of the Bodhi tree brought it back to Bodh Gaya, planted it. So the current Bodhi tree is a grandson of the original Bodhi tree. And because it's a fig, it's a ficus, ficus religiosa, it grows wide. Figs spread, kind of like banyans. You've seen banyans, right? And uh, the banyan trees are also suitable for Buddhas to wake up under. Uh, I guess in the West, we're going to have to have redwoods, have the redwood Buddha, 
wake up under the redwood trees, maybe under a, a, a ponderosa pine or a blue spruce or a birch, have a birch tree Buddha in Vermont, New Hampshire, Quebec, Ontario. So, okay, under the Bodhi tree is big and broad. It's just, it's, it's not the way you think of, you know, like a gum tree here in Australia. It's really broad. The, the base, you have to walk around it, you have to travel. Big and broad. I mean, big, big tree. Not tall that way, but big, wide. And very flourishing. And if you go to Bodh Gaya, my goodness, Bodh Gaya is a little, uh, little, lens to all of India, right? It, it sim- you can see all that is Mother India around the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. There's beggars, there are people waking up, there are oceans of red-robed Tibetan lamas uh, doing their full-body prostrations, you know. Mm. This full out, not like our f- five limbs touch the ground. There are uh, pilgrims from Taiwan all sitting together with their palms together, you know, chanting Amita, Amita. Very, very representative of, of Taiwanese Mahayana. And uh, there are um, elderly Tibetan women uh, swinging their prayer wheels. And every swing is a, is a, is a mantra, you know, and they walk and walk and walk their whole lives. They're being devout and uh, then they're the vendors and then they're the scam artists and then they're the poc- the, the, the uh, pickpockets <laughs> and the dogs and all going on at once under the Bodhi tree it's a wonderful it's, it's a cross section of of Indian civilization that has been there forever and forever probably no different in the Buddhist time right. so uh, this Bodhisattva can make all of this appear so that uh, living beings look at it, take from it what they need, get a boost in their faith, and uh, wake up each in their own time. What else? The Bodhisattva can make lights. Let's see here. Have we read that? Uh, no. Nope. I'm going to read the Chinese here. Let's see. Okay. Let's let's do it. Let's do finish it up here. Okay. We're going to world systems. Huo yu qi shen xian shi fang shi jie yi qie guang ming mo ni bao zhu ri ye xing xiu xing xiu xiu yun dian dong guang mi bu jie xian. Huo yi kou shu qi, nang dong shi fang wu liang shi jie, er bu ling zhong sheng, you jing bu xiang. Huo xian shi fang feng zai, huo zai, ji yi shui zai. Huo xian zhong sheng xin zhi suo yao. Shi xian si shen zhuang yan ju zu. Huo yu zi shen, shi xian fo shen. Huo yu fo shen, er xian zi shen. Huo yu fo shen, xian ji guo du. Huo yu ji guo du, er xian fo shen. Okay, it's a lot. Stick with me here. Or he may make all the lights of the world systems of the ten directions appear within his body. There will be lights of precious mani pearls, lights of the sun, the moon, the stars, and constellations of clouds and lightning and so forth that all appear without exception. Or he may breathe air in and out from his mouth that can make all the limitlessly many world systems throughout the world, the ten directions, tremble without alarming or frightening the minds of their sentient beings. Or he may make disasters of wind, disasters of fire, and disasters of water appear throughout the ten directions. Or, according to what delights the minds of sentient beings, he may make physical bodies appear that are perfect and splendid. Or, perhaps within his own body, he may make the body of a Buddha appear. Or, he may make his own body appear within the body of a Buddha. 
or he may make his own country appear within the Buddha's body, or he might make the body of a Buddha appear within his own country. Oh my goodness, psychic abilities, right? Who, would, who could imagine such a story? Well, to repeat, we all can, because we're all carrying the potential of these narratives encoded in our own nature should we use the Dharma to wake up to it and reveal it. It's all there. This is not an author, a fiction author's imagination. This is a pattern. These are templates, right? These are archetypes, all inherent, waiting for us to bring them out. I really completely, completely believe that is the truth, right? The Avatamsaka Sutra is not a work of fiction. It's not hypoth hypotheses. It's not conjecture, right? It's not waiting for peer review or critique from the New York Times, right? It's not. This is fundamental, ancient textbook descriptions of your, my, human nature waiting to be activated and booted up. The difference is the foundation of the Bodhisattva's Mahayana, they say, Ta Cheng Gen Xing, the root the fundamental nature of the Mahayana has been activated through a steady, step-by-step, -step, gradual development of compassion and wisdom and the interplay between them. You could also, if you wanted to say, the interplay of wisdom and blessings, both of those together. That's what creates these amazing things. So that the Bodhisattva, should he choose to, can make lights of the world systems of the ten directions appear in his body, like a light show, right? And precious money pearls that glow. Sun, moon, stars, constellations, clouds, lightning, all appear. Should he choose to do so? He may. You may. Or, this is amazing, right? Bodhisattva can go, breathe air in and out from his mouth, and all the world systems of the ten directions tremble, but the people in them go, Hoo -hoo. you know. They're not alarmed, they're not frightened. I have, a, uh, I have an earthquake, I have two, two earthquake apps on my phone that uh, tell me where in the entire world earthquakes have occurred and how big, it's called Earthquake Pro. Uh, okay, let's see here, have to open, change, cancel, there we go. So um, it's a little alarming to watch, I'm, I'm offline at the moment, so to, it's alarming to watch uh, how certain places get most of the earthquakes. One place, Omitofo, New Zealand. New Zealand is on that rim of fire, which is seismically active, right? So, uh, another place, okay, I've got it up, wow. Uh, o de Caldera in Chile just had a 4.0. Then Chile had a 2.9. Hawaii had a 2.43 29 minutes ago. Oh, Vanuatu, not far from us here, had a 6.2 just uh, 34 minutes ago. Uh, Turkey had a 3.6. Indonesia had a 3.8. Scary, uh, but amazing to see how active the planet is and how the crust of the earth is constantly adjusting and breathing. Costa Rica had a 3.0, 3 3.8 one hour ago. Um, yeah, yeah, so this is called Earthquake Pro. And the, our Bodhisattva, as I look at that, I think, how many of these are the Bodhisattva, like goofing with living beings, right? 
How many of it is the earth just going, stretching? And, holy mackerel. So the bodhisattva can go and make the earth tremble. But nobody's upset because he's doing it for a purpose of waking somebody up. He can make wind, fire, water, disasters happen. Why would he want to do that? Ask the bodhisattva, he'll tell you. Um, there was a reason for it. Um, we have a story, stories um, in DRBA about a visit by nurses to City of 10,000 Buddhas. And Master Hua and Bhikshuni, former Bhikshuni Hung Yin, Lani Bauer, was uh, taking these nuns. There was a group of nurses. They, had, they were doing investigating healing touch, among other things, uh, hands-on therapy. And uh, they went out to the area that is now being developed in the back of City of 10,000 Buddhas. And uh, sat down and talked, and the earth quaked <laughs> while Master Hua was talking. And was, everybody felt it. There was an earthquake. And he took out his staff and went, don't, and stopped. And uh, he laughed. And they're going, who is an earthquake? And he goes, no, no, don't worry about it. Boom. He stopped it, right? And it shook again. And he went, don't, stopped it. And everyone is delighted. They were thrilled. And he, he said, it's just, it's playful, he said, Telpi. And he, it was clear to all of these women, they were professional healing, healing professionals, nurses, RNs and LPNs, not your, you know, they were scientific, scientists, they were healers. And they were completely of the mind that Master Hua had controlled the earthquake twice, like that. And uh, he said, don't worry. He said, this is actually auspicious, that you came here indicates that there should be something built here in the future at some point. So, <laughs> you know, it's one of our stories. And uh, I was not there. I was in Calgary. But um, what's that about, right? So according to what delights the minds of sentient beings, he can make physical bodies appear that are perfect and splendid. It's a show. It's theater. It's bodhisattva theater. Right? Because this teacher, this teacher has been through every step. In, uh, in the ninth stage, we learned all about his ability to speak Dharma. Right? He was the Da Fasher, the great teacher, Dharma teacher. And then he was talking, but here he's using his incredible abilities to reformulate the environment to teach. Sometimes we just have to be shown. We can't be told. We've got all the reasons why we believe something. We have to show them something different. Right? So, look at this one. He can make the body of a Buddha appear inside himself, or he can appear inside the body of a Buddha. Hmm. What does this sound like? This sounds like um, one of my other lecture series is, that's gone going is one that happens yesterday. Uh, yeah, it happens in California. It's Friday afternoon. And we're, we finished with the Vajra Sutra recently. Prior to that, it was the Bodhi Resolve essay, and so on. Before that, it was the Six Patriarch Sutra. Now we're looking at the practices of repentance. Samantabhadra Bodhisattva's vow number four. Pujie uh, Hui Xiang, uh, 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 what is it? Chan Hui Ye Zhang. So, um, repenting of mistakes and renewing. So, um, one of the features of the, in the Mahayana tradition, we have this practice of what's called 
bai chan, bowing repentances. The verb is to bow. You bow a repentance. The bowing is the physical manifestation of yoga prostrations, yogic prostrations. The chan, that word, the repentance part, is what we do inside. So the body is outside. The chan, the transformation, is inside. The looking at actions and going, ooh, not the way I would do it. If I could do it again, I want to do it again different. That's the, the, the chan part, so by chan. Now, the, um, it's, uh, I think it's unique. I haven't run into, well, Jews. In Judaism, we have Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement, of at-one-ment, atonement. And Yom Kippur, I've, I've looked into it a lot, and it's, there, there's not a tremendous amount of similarity with the Buddhist approach, but it's the same direction of reflecting and saying, ah, this, I, uh, the standards of the mitzvot, the wholesome deeds that a mensch, that a, that a grown-up adult, a dajangfu, a mahapurusha, a good man will do, and I, my behavior has strayed from the mitzvot. I haven't put my heart into these good deeds and the proper behavior, so I'm going to do that. And there's lots of uh, elaboration on that in Yom Kippur. But I think other than that, there's... I haven't found, even in the, in the Theravada tradition, they don't have anything that resembles these uh, repentance liturgies. Chan yi, chan wei di yi shi. Han shi yo han du te. They, there are 64 that history knows about that are collected, the titles of which are collected in the Da Zhang Jing, in the Tripitaka. Um, but many of them are gone. We don't have the actual text, we just have their names. Of the 30-some that exist, there's a bunch that are familiar, that are, that are very popular, like the Great Compassion Repentance, the Dabe Chan. It's done every single day at City of 10,000 Buddhas, and young monks in training often will pick out uh, a repentance liturgy and practice it in their person, including who? Master Zhizhe, Zhiyi Da Shi, the uh, Tiantai Jiao Guan formulator of the Tiantai school, Master Zhiyi Zhizhe Da Shi. He made bowing repentances his primary practice. Now, mind you, the, each repentance ends with seated meditation. So it's not just bowing. There's also kneeling. There's also chanting. There's also uh, singing. There's also reciting. And there's also still seated meditation, right, in a full repentance practice. So, okay. Why am I talking about this? Because we're looking into it as a, as a community. Every Saturday in Australia time, Friday in Western and American time. In that great compassion repentance and in uh, many, many of the repentance liturgies, there is this thing called Fa Jie Guan. What is the Fa Jie Guan? Fa Jie Guan is something you do with your mind, it's a contemplation, it's a mental yoga, if you will, whereby you bow and you see your body bowing to a Buddha or a Bodhisattva and it's happening inside your mind. In your, where, where do you contemplate? Where does your mind's eye see things, right? What do you say? You say, Nang li so li xing kong ji gan ning dao jiao nan si yi. Wo zi dao chang ru di zhu. Mo mo pu sa mo mo ru lai ying xian zhong. Wo shen ying xian ru lai pu sa qian tou mian jie zu gui ming li. Right? That's how, you, how it goes. And the liturgies say, do this while you bow. Of course, you have to do it really fast, because you bow and you get back up, it's over, right? Oh, we gotta do it. Too fast, bow slower, right? So what do you say? 
this, the worshiper, me, and the thing worshiped, the, the divinity, the being worshiped, Xing Kong Ji, by nature, share a still and tranquil, quiet nature. But the response that I get, even though I'm quiet and still, Kong Ji, empty and still, and the one I'm bowing to is also empty and still, Gan Ning Dao Jiao. When I practice the Dao, there is an incredible, inconceivable response. The Dharma brings out of emptiness, brings it to life. What's the Dao Chang, Ru Di Zhu? My body is like a pearl in Indra's net, right? This perfect pearl that reflects everything and everything is reflected within it, right? What's the Dao Chang, Ru Di Zhu? My body, my, this way place, this bodhimanda of mine is like Indra's net, a, a pearl out of Indra's net. And as I look at that pearl, what happens? Ah, perhaps within his own body, he may make the body of a Buddha appear. Right there. A Buddha appears. Inside Indra's net, pearl, inside my body. Ganying Dao to see. What's the Dao term? Momo Pusa Ying Shen Zhong. Next is Wo Shen Ying Shen Ru Lai Chen. My body appears in front of the body of the Buddha or Bodhisattva inside the pearl inside my body that is quiet and still. Tomian Jezu Gwemi, and I'm bowing to him and returning and taking refuge, finding safety and security there. And then what? Gone, let it go. It's just a contemplation. But how cool is that way of using your mind? It's exactly a yoga for the mind. What's a yoga? Yoga, many kinds of yoga. It's a yoke. It's a practice. It's a form. If it's hatha yoga, you do the downwards facing dog. You do the child pose, right? You do the bow pose and you let it go. And for that moment, you are the bow. You are the dog. You are the, you know, the eagle pose. And you do that with your mind in the contemplation. You can make your own body appear within the body of the Buddha. Here's this incredible psychic ability that the Bodhisattva has to make the body of a Buddha appear or make uh, inside his body or make his body appear inside the body of a Buddha. Similar, huh? It's a contemplation. And when you're done, whoa, you know what happens when you're done with that? The ego takes a hit. There's, there's a little less of you than there was before, that constructed ego. And there's a little more of you in harmony with the template of your deepest mind. Or he can make his country appear within the Buddhist body or the body of a Buddha appear within his own country. He can extend that out into a country. Oh me, oh my. Amazing, right? This is the story of 10th stage bodhisattva and what he is able to do at this point. Now, as I mentioned, we got through the, the Shantong part today. So as I mentioned, we are uh, just at the doorstep. We're at the, at the, the, the uh, entryway to a major turning point in the 10th stage. There's a big, big question coming up. I won't tell you what it is. We'll get there next week. So, as I said, happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there and all of the kids out there who have the chance to say happy Father's Day to their dads. That's a wonderful thing going on. Um, reflecting on these psychic abilities, these shantong, it's um, important to say, because I, I, when we first started this series, I talked about how psychic powers get distorted and perverted in places where Buddhism has been a long time, like Taiwan, for example, Chinese place of Chinese culture. Um, and unscrupulous people play on the idea of, oh, I have my Tianyan, Tianyan Kaila, so, because my uh, deva eye, my 
ability to see into the heavens and the hells is now available so I can counsel you on what stocks to buy and what stocks to avoid to get rich. And I can tell you what piece of land or building to buy to get rich because I know this stuff now, right? Well, my question is, really? Chandama? Here's the third stage description of what a bodhisattva can do who has really, really opened his tenyen. So check, compare. Somebody who tells you they got their tenyen open. This bodhisattva's deva eye is purified, surpassing human sight. He sees all living beings, where they're born, where they die, with good forms or bad forms. Uh, Sam, this one is called Wuyan Liu Tong. Do you got that file? Wuyan, I sent it two weeks ago. Wuyan Liu Tong. Um, I think I only have, only have the English, sorry, but if you can follow the English there. Okay, this is down at the bottom called Deva Eye. Deva Eye. This Bodhisattva's Deva Eye is purified, surpassing human sight. He sees all living beings, where they're born, and when, they, when they're born and when they die, with good forms or bad forms, in accordance with their karma, going to good or evil destinies. He sees how, if those living beings have performed evil actions of the body, performed evil actions of speech, or performed evil actions of mind, how if they slandered worthies and sages, held deviant views, and had the causes and conditions for karma of deviant views, when their bodies decline and their lives come to an end, they certainly fall into the evil destinies and are reborn in the hells. <laughs> I got my heavenly eye open. I can see beings falling into the hells all the time. It's cool. No, you haven't. That's horrific. You wouldn't be able to bear it if you saw somebody you knew even becoming an animal or a ghost, not only the hells, right? He sees, ah, how if these living beings have performed wholesome actions with the body, wholesome actions of speech and wholesome actions of mind and have not slandered worthies and sages, but have held proper views and had the causes and conditions for karma of proper wholesome views, when their bodies decline and their lives come to an end, they certainly are reborn in the good destinies within the heavens. The Bodhisattva knows that all accurately with his deva eye, with his heavenly eye. It's not a heavenly eye. Heavenly is an adjective. It's not, oh, it's a heavenly eye. No, it's a deva eye. It's a tian yin. It's an eye. It's vision of the devas. Okay, no. it's not a comment about the eye, heavenly, it's not. That's a mistranslation. Okay, so when you have somebody, when you meet somebody who says, you know, I got my deva eye open, you can go, <coughs> you can razz them and say, I don't think so. What's it like in the hells today? If you had your tianyan kaila, you'd be able to see. And you know what you'd see? You wouldn't tell me because you'd be retching over in this gutter You'd be puking your guts out because of the horrible things you could see in the hells. Or, tell me what it's like in the heavens today. What are they doing in heaven today where worries and troubles all gone away? Right? You'd be able to tell me what they're doing in heaven today. What are they doing there now? Like the old hymn. You don't see that stuff. That's what the Tianyin is like. Okay, and I would be remiss at this point. Do I have enough time? Uh, we're probably out of time. Um, <laughs> I remember our dearly departed friend, Feng Feng, Peter Fawn, from Taiwan, the author, who maybe he did, maybe he didn't. He claimed that his tenyin opened. Master Hua said, Feng Feng, don't talk about your own virtues, he said. You will regret it. It is a mistake. Don't tell people. Well, but shirful, shirful, said Feng Feng. He says, I just have to help so many people. So he told them, write in your letters to my Tianhua news, newspaper, and I will solve your problems for you. Shirful said, Feng Feng, tell you one more time, don't do that. 
Well, he didn't listen. And he, people started once they heard, oh, you know, there's this Taiwanese writer in Vancouver who can see things that he can see beyond the veil. He knows where your grandmother went at, at death. The letters poured in and Feng Feng's vision shut down because he, once you brag about it, once there's a self, there's an ego, it's, you've covered over that original sense, source of light. Right? There's an ego that wants something. And even though what he wanted was wholesome, he wanted to help, but he didn't do it rufa. As a result, the letters came in and in. He finally published in his Tianhua magazine, I'm sorry, please stop. I no longer have that ability to see what I used to be able to see. I can't help you. The letters kept pouring in. And everybody behind these letters, you know, had some horrible, sad, painful story to tell. You know, it's my, my, I don't know what happened. I haven't, my daughter walked away from home three weeks ago and we can't find her. Please use your eye to tell us where, you know. On and on and on. Why do I have this disease? Why did my, was my daughter born blind, you know, my son? And Feng Feng had to just swallow it. So it's not so simple. We are, people are hungry to know things that we can't see with our ordinary vision. And it can become greed really easily. And then they blame you if you make the claim that you can see those things and you don't tell them, people are not forgiving of that. You helped them, why didn't you help me? You know, oh my goodness. With the best of intention, it becomes something sad. Omitofo. Okay, uh, well, our time has reached an end again today. And uh, next week we will continue with our story of the 10th stage Bodhisattva. The description of Shantung has come to an end, and we're going to find out. Uh, it has a very interesting twist in the story that I think is unexpected. Um, so there's 161 of us today on YouTube listening in, in the, on the Chinese network. 59. So pretty close, 200 folks. That's a good average. Very much appreciate the volunteers who are uh, helping this this lecture series get out to the world. So many moving parts, so many conditions stacked on top of each other to make it happen. Like in touching my keyboard and having Zoom quit suddenly, instantly, <laughs> unexpectedly, er, not my fault. So uh, could I invite uh, the monks of the Berkeley Monastery, whoever is on duty today, listening in, to tell us about uh, the two events that will happen tomorrow and the next day. Who's there to speak up? Okay, I can say something. Uh, this is Jin Chuan. Jin Chuan, sure, yeah. identify yourself, say hello. This is Jin Chuan, yeah, I'm a BBM. So tomorrow we have the Earth Store Sutra recitation by Dharma Master Jing Fu in Chinese. If you go to the berkeleymonastery.org website, our master. Okay, I will. Maybe see that on our front page. Here we go, coming right up, hold on. First thing that happens is the modem has to report. So it's going to say Telstra. Hold on here. Be right with you. Berkeleymonastery.org. Telstra pops up. Oh, it didn't. There we go. Okay, here we are. So 8.30 to 10 a.m. and 2 to 4 p.m. We'll be reciting the Earth Store Sutra in Chinese. And in the morning, we'll do the Long Life transference and the afternoon will do the rebirth transference um we actually did not send off the pieways on the seventh day of our amitabha session because people hope to keep their pieways for the ulambana and the earth store session or store recitation so we kept them just for you could say maybe extra dharma and then we're going to um send them off at tomorrow the ulambana ceremony was, has already happened 
this morning, but you can watch the recording online on um, that YouTube recording link. Um, and I guess recite yourself if you wish. Um, and otherwise, that's pretty much our our current schedule. Um, all our regular programs are still going on at BBM Online. So you can join us all the way from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. for three hours of Dharma practice from morning ceremony to meditation to a Dharma reflection and three steps, one bow. Um, and then in the afternoon from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., we have Guan Yin recitation and Amitabha recitation. We've been kind of joking that this is a direct flight to the, the Pure Land. <laughs> with direct Guanin, flight Bodhisattva to and, mm. and Amitabha. We got a donation today that says, I'm making a donation for my airplane ticket. <laughs> your airplane ticket. Okay, better check your visa. They're tightening yeah. up. So, so um, but then at uh, 6.30, evening chanting, and then 7.30, we sometimes have sutra lectures at night. Otherwise, we have the mantra heart recitation at 7.30 to 7.50. Um, you can go down below, and there's a number of additional practices, like 2 to 3.30, Amitabha recitation, and then sutra lectures. I believe Jing Hao is lecturing on Saturday, 5 to 6, Medicine Master Buddha Sutra. I'm doing a Dharma practice Q&A. I'll put this tomorrow from one, roughly 105 to 2. After our afternoon practice, we'll be talking about gratitude to parents tomorrow. And then Thursday night, 7.30 to 9, 9, 9.30, will be Infinite Life Sutra Lecture by Dharma Master Jing Fu. And we have uh, talks on repentance by Reverend Shur, 1230, 12.30 to 1.30 on Fridays. So a lot of Dharma activities for those who want to join. Okay. Thank you for that. Good stuff. Um, I might mention... For people who would like to see Chinese sign language, can, let's see, I need to, this is going to take just a second here. Um, some of you may recall that Janice Ian put out a new song for everyone to record on their own better times um, sure and Janice said um, everyone is welcome to make this song their own better times will come and my buddy Steve Boffman told me about it and said hey we could use a Chinese version so we put out That's our translation. Cliff and I worked on this. So. Okay, so that has 2,800 views at this point. That was from May. Well, we now have, uh, Janice came back and said, you know, she said, um, we've, I would love to have sign language versions. Uh, sign language. She said, is there such a thing as Chinese sign language? We said, by golly, uh, we'll find out. And sure enough, here is the, ch the Chinese sign language, Zhongguo Shouyu, right? Chinese, Chinese sign language version of the uh, better times will come. So I'm singing, uh, there we go, copy that. I'm singing, I'm gonna post that into the chat and if Jerry can forward that out into the community, that would be good. Put that onto YouTube. Um, can everybody see where that is? Can you get the, is that possible? Yeah. So here's, this is uh, Yao Ayun from Guangzhou uh, down here in the corner doing a very lively spirited version of Better Times Will Come in Chinese while the subtitles are in English are running under the screen. See what you think. I'll play just a little bit of this. And if people would, wouldn't mind passing this on, um, going on, to t listen to the whole thing. Her sign language is worth the visit. Take a look. Yeah. 
okay, you get the idea. That's uh, the, um, I've been told by someone who appreciates sign language and can do American sign language that uh, Yao Ayun's version here is really clear. He said her, her signing is so precise and lively and nice to watch that uh, it inspired him. He's an old school teacher. Uh, it inspired him to go back and brush up his American Sign Language because he saw how, uh, how clear she is doing it and he wanted to clean up his own American Sign Language watching her Zhongguo Shouyu, Chinese Sign Language. So, how cool is that? Here's uh, going into it a bit. You can see some more of her skill. Uh, forward here, that's the chorus. Here we go. Okay, Ming Tian Yi Ding Hui Gong Hao. So pass that on if you get a chance and let more people see their, maybe their first exposure to Chinese Sign Language. It was for me. And uh, also, that's a good song for the time that we're in now, which is a difficult time. Um, to conclude today's lecture with gratitude for everybody who helped me put this out and to the, the uh, Australian magpies that are singing out in the yard here, I would like to invite you to join me and transfer the merit by using Medicine Buddha's mantra instead of our dedication of merit replace that song today with these wholesome vibrations that uh, are designed to heal right um, in our Friday lecture on repentance we're looking into the Medicine Buddha repentance liturgy Yao Shi Bao Chan and uh, it's clear that this mantra is central to the healing of this, the ceremony. When we want to look into how does Medicine Buddha heal illness, this mantra is big. It's a big part of it. This is the Sanskrit of it, and we do it to a melody. And we can use the same song sound, the melodies, uh, and the, the vibration of the, the lyrics as a transference. So please make a wish for however you would like to benefit the world. And if it focuses on the coronavirus, mm, more's the better, right? That's all to the good. However you, whatever you want to do with your transference, that's up to you, but this is a good way to do it. So let's, let's do it together. And that will be the end. We'll bow three times at the end and we're done. I just realized I didn't unoptimize my screen. Here we go. Arate samyak sambudaya padyata Aisaje, Aisaje, Aisaja Samudgate Swaha Oh,
Bhagavati by Sajjaguru by Durya Prabharajaya Mahagapaya Arahate Samyak Sambharaya Vajjata Okay, make a wish by Sajjaya by Sajjaya by Maybe keep that one going throughout the day and night. That's how these mantras get strong, as they become adapted to our inner rhythms and they just keep rolling. So that's Gung Fu with mantras, right? Bunian or Nian. Nian or Bunian. Okay, so we bow three times. I've got Guanyin Bodhisattva before she was gilded there on my screen. Here we go. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Thanks for joining everyone. See you next week.